Section 5 of Modern Russian Poetry and Anthology Selected and translated by Babette Deutsch and Avram Yarmolinsky. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson Yakov Polonsky 1819-1898 The routine of Polonsky's uneventful life was compounded of teaching, editorial work, and long years of service in the censorship department. It is true that he traveled abroad and spent some years in the Caucasus, but this did not interrupt the even tenor of his ways. He was a prolific fiction writer, yet it is as a poet that he lives in the memory of his compatriots. His poetry itself has been charged with being lukewarm and neither hot nor cold. It lacks, it has been said, that cosmic nostalgia and civic consciousness which belongs to Russian poetry. Indeed, Polonsky's poetic effigy is rather unheroic and indistinct in outline. Yet he has the virtues of his defects. His work is distinguished by its homeliness. It keeps to the lighted circle of our familiar and familial life, and foregoes power and passion for intimacy and charm. THE COSMIC FABRIC This vast web of nature's weaving is God's garment, so tis said. In that fabric I a living, I a still unbroken thread. And the threads run swiftly, never halting, yet if once they sever, seer or sage shall not suffice, then the parted strands to splice. For the weaver so will veil them, that, let him who may bewail them, none the ends shall ever find, nor one broken thread rebind. Ceaselessly the threads are breaking. Short, ah, short, will be my span. Meanwhile, at his fabric's making, toils the cosmic artisan, curious patterns still designing, wave and crested hill defining, step and pasture, cloud and sky, wood and field of golden rye, Though with care the wise may scan it, Flawless since that hand began it, Smooth and fine with fair accord Shines the garment of the Lord. Sorrow's Madness When clinging to your lidded coffin I saw you, love, on your last journey go, My sobs, my maddened heart could soften and I seem dead like you below. Yours was the grave men see so often, your small frame fitted snugly so, with leaden stupor blinded. I beheld it vanish, I heard the clods soft blow. My coffin was not thus, but spacious, and gay with leaves, and a blue pall in state, and fastened to it glared the sun of midday, a gilded gaudy coffin-plate. Your coffin disappeared beneath wet earth and gravel, but mine, alas, still glittered mockingly, an orphaned soul and widowed. I let my sad eyes travel about me, my heart's heart, and I could see how buried deep in my resplendent coffin and bearing death within me I would sue for happiness, now lost forever. I knew my nothingness, my thirst for you. I longed to break the spell of numbness, lay waste my living tomb, wrench back its bars, to tear aside the grave clothes of the heavens, to stamp upon the sun and scatter wide the stars, and dash across this endless graveyard, where dead worlds fill the graves. 
to find your dwelling where no memories languish to death's void galley chained like sullen slaves Vladimir Solovyov, 1853 to 1900. Coming from a family of scholars and churchmen, Solovyov was himself a mystic and visionary, an alien seed in an exorcised age. He was a cross between a Bohemian and a lay monk whose asceticism only emphasized his powerfully erotic nature a spirit dedicated to the creation of the greatest philosophical system which Russia has given to the world, was fain to express itself also in poetry. His one slender volume of lyrics has the quality of soaring spirituality and is generally engaged with a supersensuous reality, occasionally broken by eruptions of spasmodic comedy. It is largely centered about the concept of the eternal feminine, which also plays an important part in his grandiose religious system. He conceives it not as Aphrodite, but rather as Sophia, divine wisdom. The feminine principle materialized itself for the mystic in a Dantesque experience. In a reminiscential poem written eight years before his death, he relates how, as a boy of nine, he first glimpsed his eternal mate. This was in Moscow. He next sees her in the reading room of the British Museum thirteen years later, as he bends over volumes of abstruse mystical literature. She bids him follow her to Egypt. It is a biographic fact that the young docent traveled across the continent to Cairo and went afoot into the desert, where he beheld his beatific vision for the last time. Below the Sultry Storm Below the sultry storm that seemed to lower an alien force, again I heard the call of my mysterious mate, the prisoned power of old dreams flared and flickered in its fall. And with a cry of horror and of dolor, as of an eagle in an iron vice, my spirit shook its cage in quivering choler and tore the net and issued to the skies and up behind the clouds unswerving bearing before the miracles of flaming sea within the shining sanctum briefly flaring it vanished into white infinity with wavering feet with wavering feet i walked where dawn-lit mists were lying to find the shores of wonder and of mystery dawn struggled with the final stars frail dreams were flying while unto unknown gods my morning lips were crying the prayers that my dream-imprisoned soul had whispered me. The noon is cold and candid, the road winds on severely, and through an unknown land once more my journey lies. The mist has lifted now, and the stark eye sees clearly how hard the mountain road that rises upward sheerly, how distant looms the dream, the prescient heart decries. Yet onward with unfaltering feet I shall be going, toward midnight, onward toward the shore of my desires, where on a mountain height new stars its glory showing, my promised temple waits, with plinth and pillar glowing, beaten about with flame of white triumphal fires. N. Minsky, pseudonym of Nikolai Vilenkin, Born 1855. The son of poor Jewish villagers, Minsky was, among other things, tutor, lawyer, and bank employee before he emigrated to Paris in 1905 at the age of 50, where he has lived as newspaper correspondent and littérateur ever since. He had previously lived abroad and was abreast of European literary movements. His ideological and poetic career has been no less kaleidoscopic. Beginning as a poet insistent upon civic virtues and art as criticism of life, within some ten years Minsky became the prophet of amoralism, decadence, symbolism, and the champion of Bacchic beauty. Early in the twentieth century he joined with sophisticated orthodox priests and lay God-seekers in founding a society for the promotion of a new religious consciousness. 
himself preaching a nebulously negative mystic doctrine of meonism, affectionately envisioning a new nirvana. The revolution of 1905 inspired his muse briefly to Marxian hymns and helped him in his Parisian exile. Here, in addition to his other work, he wrote a dramatic trilogy. Minsky had a weakness for manifestos, of which his poetry was not always a successful illustration. It is only his later work, with its increased technical skill, that achieves the bodying forth of his curious intellection. Force She lies, opening her teats, strong, swollen, wide, and at her breasts their equal gift bestowing, Mad Nero and meek Buddha clutch, unknowing, as clinging twins who suckle side by side. She holds two vessels, whence, forever flowing, the streams of life and death serenely glide. She breathes, and wreaths of stars are lit and bide. She breathes anew, they fly like sere leaves blowing. She looks ahead with cold, unseeing eyes. She cares not, though she bear or cause to perish, the children whom she nourishes she will cherish, but when she weans them, every claim denies. Evil and good gather them in thereafter and play the cosmic game with idle laughter. My Temple Who rears a temple rears two monuments his own and the destroyers they who build accept hero stratos arbitraments and to the torch the chisel's work is willed both will stand firm before posterity and equal glory fame to each will lend but thou my air-domed temple shall not be mocked by the vengeance of the general end on an abyss of ruin is thy lease Thou art the furnace of negation fired, in thee the hymns of solace shall not cease. With sorrow winged by calm despair, inspired, thee legioned sufferings guard in iron mail, and in their vanguard death who shall prevail. Dmitri Meryashkovsky, born 1865 Mirishkovsky had every opportunity of study and travel afforded the son of a comfortably circumstanced bureaucratic family. He made his pilgrimage to the seats of the antique Mediterranean culture, and the Parthenon brought him, like Renan, to his knees. Yet this devout and learned Hellenist is much of a lay theologian, he has constructed a professedly mystical but actually rationalistic religion which dominates all his work. The synthesis of paganism and Christianity, of flesh and spirit, which is his religion of the Third Testament, is the Procrustean bed of both his brilliant criticism and his vast historical novels. In the latter, his method is chiefly that of a historical mosaicist, his trilogy is accessible to the English reader, as well as some of his critical work, notably a part of his remarkable study on Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. His prose forms the bulk of his writings. As a poet, Mieroszkowski was one of the initiators of the modernist movement, but he counts mainly as the champion of their poetics. His own lyrical work is largely ineffectual and imitative of men as curiously alien to him as Baudelaire, Poe, and Nietzsche. Against a background of melancholy pieces expressing metaphysical ennui and cold intellection, one finds some poems informed with spiritual beauty and religious intensity. A Prayer Cast prostrate in mourning Wingless self-scorning, grief in a gust, flings us dust upon dust. We desire not, we dare not, we believe not, we care not. No wisdom has worth. God, do thou dower us, kindle, empower us, give of thy mirth from the languor that clings. Give us wings, give us wings, wings of thy spirit. THE TRUMPET CALL 
Over earth awakes a whirring, and a rustling and a stirring. Trumpet voices fill the skies. Lo, they call us, Brothers, rise! No, the darkness holds unshaken. I will sleep and not awaken. Do not rouse me, do not call. Do not strike the coffin wall. Now you dare not sleep. Resounding sternly, the last trump is sounding. They are rising from the tomb, as from the maternal womb of the opened earth, forth flinging from their graves the dead are springing. No, I cannot. All unuttered, my words died. My eyes are shuttered. I shall not believe their lies. I shall not. I cannot rise. Brother, I am ashamed and shrinking. Dust, corruption, rotting, stinking. Brother, God has seen our prison. All shall wake, and all be risen. All shall yet be judged by him, cherubim and seraphim. High the holy throne are bearing. Here our heavenly king is faring. Brother, he must live who dies. Glad or grieving, thou shalt rise. THE CURSE OF LOVE with heavy anguish, hopeless straining, the bonds of love I would remove. Oh, to be loosed from their enchaining, oh, freedom, only not to love. The soul that shame and fear are scourging crawls through a mist of dust and blood. From dust, great God, my spirit purging, oh, spare me from love's bitter flood. Is pity's wall alone unshaken? I pray to God, I cry in vain. More weary, by all hope forsaken, resistless love grows great again. There is no freedom unforgiven. We live as slaves by life consumed. We perish, tortured, bound, and driven, promised to death and to love doomed. End of section 5 Recording by Kevin Davidson www.blogordive.com